Welcome to Coach's Corner. Each of these episodes is intended to highlight a specific topic relevant to all trail runners. We start in the form of a statement, get a true or false answer from each coach, and then discuss the nuances that make the real answer less clear. Ultimately, the purpose is to provide you with information that you can apply to your own training. Our coaches are Chrissy Mel, David Roach, Ian Sharman, and me, Sean Bearden. On the website and at the end of this episode, you'll find links to their web pages and more information about them as individual athletes and coaches. The true false for today is cross training is essential for runners. So, Chrissy, what do you say? True. Ian. True. <laughs> David. Oh man, I was going to say true, but since we need to have a sexy disagreement, I'm going to go false because it's always in between. So, <laughs> Well, good for you because I am a true on that also. And so uh, that will at least get Bridges some discussion. So let's find out why true first and then we're going to come back to you, Dave, and you're going to have to argue the counterpoint. Uh, Chrissy, why true? I have just found for so many years in my personal and in coaching experience that Balancing the running motion, which is very linear and straightforward with cross-training exercises, moving in different planes, moving different weights around, the more years and time I add to anybody's running, including my own, the cross-training becomes more and more evident to, I think, mostly prevent injury. So any type of overuse injury can be I w mostly prevented by using different forms of training to balance out the running. And Ian, something to add to that? Well, I, I agree with that in the first place. I, I would say there's no doubt that the most specific thing for getting you fitter for running is running. If you want to run up a mountain, you've got to practice running up mountains. If you want to run downhill better, you've got to be running downhill. But you can mimic elements of that in ways that can be less stressful to the body, that can provide more variety and therefore uh, a lower chance of injury. And allow you to either take on a bit more workload or at least to strain the body in different ways so it is more sustainable. So usually with cross-training, uh, the big caveat I'd say is the closer it is to running, the better. So things like uh, an elliptical train is a bit better. It's the same kind of motion but without having the impact forces. Um, Cycling is kind of useful but it's not got as much of a, a, a crossover. The, the one I actually use the most is hiking and, and just walking every day, which I count as a, a form of cross training because it's not actually running, but it's something to add in in addition to it. Uh, and then in, in addition to that, also a little bit of um, weight related training as well, potentially in the gym. But you could use anything. I mean, if someone loves playing soccer, if they love playing tennis, you can use that as a form of cross training. And a big part of it as well is making sure that it's something they enjoy. I always say to people, if you run to stay fit, but you don't like it, don't do it. Do another sport. But if you have other sports that you love doing as well as running, there's no reason to stop doing them. And there's ways that you can fit them in so it helps your running as much as possible and avoids kind of overdoing things. But it's not that, you know, if you spend five days a week playing tennis, that's going to cut into the amount of running you can do. And therefore, uh, you probably wouldn't be quite as good a runner as you could be. But you can balance the two things together or whatever the sports are together to, to make them work well for your running too. All right, David. So you've self you volunteered to, to argue the counterpoint. So give us give us reasonings for why this could be false. Well, I'm a I'm a huge fan of cross training, but it's not essential. And um, there are a lot of stories of people that skew it all together um, and have subsequently have success. I don't know how sustainable it is all the time if that's the case, but I feel like it's important to make sure that people understand. Like, you know, you don't. It's not, you don't have to be doing these things all the time to be a good runner. Though, like Chrissy said, it'll improve longevity. As Ian said, it'll make you stronger. Um, but it's like, if you're extremely time limited, if you're just like getting your 30 minute run in is a big deal each day in terms of your life, then maybe cross training can fall by the wayside in some instances. Um, and all that being said, I am a huge fan for a number of reasons we'll get into. Yeah. And so I'm going to bridge on something that Ian said and, and probably link up a little bit with what you're thinking there, David, maybe at least in part and, and throw in a couple of ideas. One that trail running and especially mountain trail running is more variable than something like road running. And so there's, there is built into it a you know, less rep less specific repetitiveness, which can, can be a problem that we can, 
we can talk about. But I also want to dive into defining training and defining cross training because, you know, because I define those, I think, a little bit differently than the more popular notions of those terms. To me, training is everything that goes into helping you become a better at whatever it is you're trying to become better at. In this case, it's to become a better runner. And so it's the complete umbrella. And what most people use when they use, they're thinking of when they think of the term training are what I would call workouts, exercise. So to me, cross training is a sub component of training per se in that to me, I think of cross training as all of the non-running things you do that are part of your training. So in, in a lot of ways, this question for me is inherently true because to me, cross training is a component of training, period. I include sleep, nutrition, psychology, all as components of training, but to me, those are cross training. Um, but going back to the actual popular notion of cross training though, um, you know, I still believe that this is, this is true um, in part because I think that there are very specific things that you can do that help to leverage your ability to run better much quicker and much more specifically, things like strength training to improve neuromuscular control and an economy of running that I think can really be useful early on in the beginning. And maybe, David, I'll throw it back to you. Maybe this is kind of where you were going. Yeah, definitely. So when I was talking about cross training, I'm thinking more of aerobic activity uh, to support running, but lifting can be thrown in there too. Um, I mean, I think if cross training and was bad, or, or less productive because, um, you know, that's kind of what Ian was getting at. And there are things that are less productive. So it's important to identify those. So the good, I mean, you guys got into already one, it's less run, training, especially is less repetitive. Um, that aerobic development you get from cross training can always be helpful. Climbing strength. It really, it helps. I mean, I'm looking right here at Mount Sinitas and Boulder and some of the fastest times on Mount Sinitas are not by, done by runners. It's they're done by cyclists. So that's a straight uphill grind that involves climbing and hiking and that sort of thing. And so that makes sense, right? Because they're extremely strong, aerobically fit. Um, and then injury, as Christy mentioned. So those are three big positive ones. And um, the bad are, you know, re cross training, replacing running in most studies shows reductions in running economy. Um, so that's, that could be a potential bad. And two is resilience. So, you know, n no non weight bearing activity is really going to help you um, with the specific demands of absorbing energy while running. So, um, yeah, so cross training, like it can be really good, but if athletes do it at the expense of running, um, it often can like lead to worse results, at least temporarily. And that's kind of what most of the studies that I was looking at show is that cross training plus you're running great almost across the board. Um, though maybe if you're racing like a 10 K on the track, it'd be a little different cross training, replacing some running. It can go both ways. It's really highly individual. Um, and then just cross training and running in a minimal amount, probably not as productive as it could be. So, um, you know, everyone falls in that spectrum and, um, there's some things that are unequivocally good. You know, sh there's almost no study that shows specific strength training specific to running is not a good thing. So it is good. Um, you know, elliptical bike, things like that can be really good. Something like if you start to mix it up completely to like rower, who knows? Um, and we're getting into the experiment of one section, which is what makes this question so fascinating and why I'm going to be really interested to hear Ian and Chrissy, because both you guys are especially known in your own athletic life and as coaches for, for leveraging some of these ideas. And, um, yeah, I'm excited to learn what you guys think is best and how you use it. Yeah, Come on, Chris, I'm not even going to add it. I'm going to bounce it right straight to you guys. We'll let yeah. it go. Got it. Okay. And Ian, you want me to? You, you go first, in? yeah. I just really like listening to everybody go around. You guys, we have such different like ways of looking at the same thing, but um, we always come back to that um, study of who, or not study of, but um, specificity to the person. So each athlete, each body, each mindset is going to be ha approach the same thing differently and what works best for them. Sean, you mentioned the all-inclusive, how cross-training is the sports psychology, the sleep, your nutrition, and all that. I really appreciate that piece. And when you were saying it, it made me remember something that came up really early for me is time on feet. I remember when I first got into the sport, we would go for a big trail run out at Cougar Mountain and then come back and work a full day at the running store. 
and the, the guys would say, this is time on feet. Like we went and ran hard and all of those factors, especially in ultra running play into the whole mental game of, well, I can do that. And this here I am at mile 80. Can I get back out of this chair? So having those mental components, the physical components, having all those pieces add up. So when it comes to day of performance, you're ready to roll. And so I really appreciated that point, Sean, of the the all inclusive part of how cross training really is like what we're doing on a daily basis, whether it's sitting at our desk or out doing the run that our coach prescribed for us. Um, the lever, the timing of cross training, a lot of times, I think David, you were saying where if you only have 30 minutes a day to do your run, then it's probably good to do your run. I was also thinking on the other end of it, when you're in like full training mode and you're putting in 80 to hundred mile weeks, getting ready for a hundred mile or maxing out your time. Let's say you have eight hours a week to train and that's what you need to maximize those weeks really focus on the running and then bring the cross training in when there's more space and time for that. So maybe there's a two, you know, four to eight week section where we take a break from that. And not only for the physical component, which I'm hundred percent fully on also have mental fatigue. Like I love running. I've been doing this for 18 years. I need breaks every once in a while. So I love to move and get around and, and feel like good in my body. And that's where cross training becomes a good piece for that too, to keep running fresh and ex- like wanting to come back to it and having a way to maintain during that time to wait for that um, fire to relight, if you will, after you go big. So that was just some thoughts that came up listening to you guys go around the circle. Well, I think one of the reasons why we chose this topic as well is uh, when people listen to this, it won't be quite as timely, but it was only a week ago that Rob Kra won uh, Leadville, having done the bike race, the 100-mile bike race, the week before the 100-mile run. And the same weekend, um, Dakota Jones won the Pikes Peak Marathon, having cycled there from Durango, so 250 miles, cycling to the race and cycling back as well. So quite a lot of people were saying, oh, maybe this is the, the magic ingredient here. Because they did this extra cycling, they were much better runners. But also, you've got to bear in mind that there's a lot of runners who don't do that. You know, someone like Jim Wormsley, uh, look at any Olympian. They're not doing huge amounts of cycling. So you can't say because those two people did some cycling right before that clearly this is the new fad that we should all be doing and it's going to make you awesome at running. Uh, I know there's a couple of studies that I've seen where it shows that cycling fitness doesn't translate to running that well, while running fitness translates to cycling fitness pretty well. And if you remember years ago when Lance Armstrong so I've got many things that are just cut, flown through my mind at the same time. <laughs> Lance Armstrong took on the New York Marathon. And people were saying, oh, with his VO2 max and his fitness, he's going to run 215. And the guy ran 245. And that's, you know, with some added help from other things as well that, that we now know about later on. <laughs> so the point being there that even, you know, the fittest cyclist in the world isn't necessarily the best runner. And so it's to bear in mind how much things do cross over and that cycling is, for example, is not one of the best things to do, but doing it a little bit in, in a, uh, addition to your running is good. And the main way that I tend to incorporate um, cross training is really just as active recovery. So I say it's definitely going to be helpful if you get on the bike to just get a little bit more time on feet effectively. Uh, it's getting the blood pumping around, same with walking, same with hiking. It's just allowing you to get active recovery while doing a hard workout on the bike maybe that's not going to be as useful because it might eat into your running time or your ability to do a hard run. But I think that the main thing with seeing guys like uh, you know, Rob Gra and Dakota doing so well that people didn't necessarily factor in is that because they were doing quite a lot of cycling just before the race, and these are high mileage guys, I know Dakota in the past has done 200 miles a week, I think at the most, that maybe just the fact that they were doing a bit less hardcore running right before their race, maybe a bit more tapering is what made the difference because they weren't necessarily hammering it with all of the cycling training they were doing. So they were already very fit runners and then doing a little bit less running uh, when they're already doing huge amounts might have been something that made the difference there too. Plus there's you know random variables in there that maybe Rob would have run even quicker, maybe Dakota would have run even quicker without the cycling. We don't have a counterfactual there. So that was just like 10 thoughts I've just spewed out. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> You know, you know, so Lance Armstrong also commented that running, running that marathon was the hardest thing he had ever done. Oh, wow. it, it, it does really leverage, wow. what, it does leverage what you're saying there about how, about, you know, the one about, um, 
crossing over one way, but perhaps not the other, um, that this incredible cyclist found running to be so demanding and so hard on the body. In fact, I've, I've you know, interviewed people for the Science of Ultra podcast that have, have noted that in their research, they were able to pretty easily get runners towards overtraining syndrome, but no matter how hard they push cyclists, they couldn't get them there over the course of a, of a study uh, in a semester. And, and it's just because of the, you know, the beating and the pounding and, and, and everything that goes into running. And I was thinking exactly the same thing you were. You're thinking very much like a scientist. It's, so it's not just, you know, what somebody did looking at, say, well, they did this. And so therefore that helped them. But it's also considering what did they not do? Right. Yeah. And so maybe mm -hmm. in cycling. That, that was maybe my first thought when people started saying that was, okay, well, that's one variable out of say 10 that was probably important there. So what were the other ones? We don't know most of them, but one of the clear ones was if you're doing that much cycling, you, you must be doing less running, you know, so, so that we know that if someone does cycling for several days before the race, they're not also going out for a 10 mile run in the evening to add on to that. But those people, now those two and, and others in the same sort of situation have, have already really developed and built their ability mm -hmm. to do what they do in right. the years before. And David, you and I had a little email going this weekend. And so I know you've got some thoughts on that issue. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that the, like, let's, what you were saying about um, the studies first, um, I think is really interesting that the runners were able to get closer to overtraining than the cyclists. And I think that that really gets back to an idea that all runners are, to a certain extent, aerobically underdeveloped relative to what the human body is capable of. Swimmers and cyclists, particularly or triathletes, train just a massive amount of aerobic volume more. Um, and we can't do that because of pounding, though Jim Walmsley is putting that to the test. Um, and, you know, Killian might I'd also be an example. Like I've heard rumors about Killian's like actual training that he trains very similar to a cyclist, but on his feet. Um, so those people are kind of pushing the bounds of what, of what runners can do. But for almost everyone else, even runners doing 120 miles a week, that's far less total aerobic volume than you do in some other sports. So cross training is a way to kind of get at some of that aerobic volume. The problem becomes to, to get to the, the heart of the matter what happens if you've never developed your running economy in the first place? Um, so all the studies show that running economy is kind of sticky. So once you develop it, even when you back off for an extended period of time, like get injured or something, it comes back far quicker. Um, that can be for a number of reasons, probably everything from like epigenetics to neuromuscular and all that. Um, so, you know, with people like D Dakota and um, Rob, they've clearly developed their running economy massively. I mean, Rob was basically a four minute miler and, you know, Dakota is fast and one of the best, run best trail runners of our, of our generation. Um, meanwhile, Lance Armstrong had never really developed his running economy in a serious way, you know, for decades. Um, so, you know, then you're seeing the opposite end of it. And most of us in reality fall somewhere in between. Um, so, you know, you kind of need to consider where you're coming from with your running. If you've never gotten, like developed your speed, probably cross training um, is something that should only support your running. Um, like Ian was saying, like active recovery, that sort of thing. Maybe if you've already developed though, and you're pretty close to that, your cross training can start being extra workouts, um, where you actually use it to layer in intensity that you might, your body might not want to handle on the run or, you know, just trying to extend your longevity. Um, and just an example of that really quickly that I thought was really interesting is this woman, um, from, around here named Tess Amer, Amer. Um, and so she was, had a lot of injuries, but she was fast when she was in high school, she got into biking and triathlon and she became very good at that sport. But in the process became one of the, became like one of the best up and coming trail runners. She was just second at Pikes Peak Ascent, um, and crushed the dirty 30, 12 mile hour course record and all those different things. So for her, this person coming from speed and, but had injury risks, cross training, like caused a massive leap in performance. Um, you know, that N equals one, but then there's also, you know, examples the other way, like Lance and others that you don't get that, that response. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would be interested, like Ian and Chrissy, do you guys ever use it as harder workouts or is this mostly like easy aerobic, like low level aerobic stuff? Like, yeah, I'd love to know a little bit more about that. I don't put in specific things like cycling or other th so other stuff that isn't gym work or or hiking or walking that is hard. I say if you want to do those things easy, active recovery. If you want to do them harder, 
then because it's a sport you love doing, then we'll factor that in of how we need to adjust the, the amount of running. But typically speaking, uh, I would say it's okay to have those harder sessions in there. I wouldn't be adding them in purposefully as long as they're not going to leave you then sore and tired for your run. So if you do a you know five-hour bike ride on Saturday and you're hoping to nail your 20-mile run on Sunday – but each time you find that your legs are jelly, then that's going to be counterproductive for your running. While if you've got the cycling fitness that you can do that and you feel nothing the next day, then that's probably going to be enhancing it. So it, it very much depends on the person's uh, fitness with the other sport they're, they're doing in there as well. And I think one of the, the key things that you mentioned uh, was just how it can help keep people from being injured. I think that's probably the biggest area that cross training can help is to make sure the workload isn't too much, make sure the person's strong enough and supple enough and, and able to uh, avoid overdoing things. And also, if you get injured, coming back from injury and maintaining fitness. So if someone uh, is unable to run, but they can bike or they can swim or they can do something else, they're going to get back to fitness sooner. And that means they get more consistency. And the priority is always making sure that you're not making any injury worse, but using cross training to fill in the gaps when someone can't run, when they're having an off season on purpose or when they're having an injury that they're having to deal with that maintains more of the fitness increases the overall consistency for the the last few months and that will enhance their running fitness quite a bit while someone who gets injured sits around for two months and does nothing is going to have a much harder route back to to, to running again and also a much higher chance of getting injured when they come back too well i'm going to jump in really quick because that reminded me today while i was running i was thinking about things that like talking points for this and um i saw vultures flying into a very stiff, typical boulder wind. And um, this kind of gets back to the cross training and injury situation. So the way that these particular ones were flying, I don't know anything about bird air, like, you know, flight dynamics. So I'm sure there's someone listening that does, um, is that they would turn with the wind briefly and then swoop down into the wind. So they use their, um, so they would develop momentum by going backwards and then would go forwards using that momentum. So as they swooped and that made me think of like cross training and injury and in that, you know, when you're cross training, you're kind of just developing that momentum so that when you get to running, you can then use it. Um, and I mean, I, I think we probably all as coaches and athletes have seen that examples of that. I mean, um, you know, the one that's on top of my tongue is this woman from Boulder as well named Nicole Miracle, who, um, long-term injury of a couple of years, cross trained her butt off and in the hasn't since she did that big cross training box, she's kept cross training in and is now like one of the obstacle course racing, um, world champions, you know, and not only that, she like crushes trail races. So clearly cross training helped her with that injury cycle. So, um, Chrissy, like how do you use cross training? I'd love to know that. Well, first that was a beautiful analogy with the bird. I love <laughs> your thought process on that. <laughs> Um, I'm super similar to Ian. And I, as, as you were talking initially, Ian, I was thinking about the whole injury piece. That was what I was going to add in. And then you rolled right into that because I have had a couple of clients and myself too need to switch gears and maybe they're close to an event and a little niggle comes in. And so we'll switch pretty much similar workouts to what they would be doing running in terms of intervals or, or longer tempo runs or something and just switch them onto a bike or a rower or swim, whatever it is that they'll do. Again, the factor being, what do you like to do? What will you do? Let's, let's um, use that as a way to get, hopefully get through this injury, not aggravate it more, and then maintain the fitness that they've been working so hard for to get ready for this event. Um, one thing I would add to what you said with that, Ian, is the mental support. Because most of us as mm -hmm. runners, as we've talked about before, are very um, in our heads about our sport and that how movement helps us. And so if we're not able to run, that can be really, I mean, put it on there, it could be depressing. So if you have a way to have an outlet to keep the mental part positive and a phys the physical helping the mental part to be positive, I think cross training can be so helpful that way. So yeah, similar to Ian, how's that answer to your question, David? <laughs> you, I'm, I'm curious, like coming from, you know, you have both the practical and the scientific background, like how do you like to use it? Yeah. So for me, I, I rarely, really, if ever, uh, prescribe any sort of aerobic uh, non-running activities unless there's an, an injury consideration or staleness, like Chrissy is kind of alluding to there. 
So if we're talking about rehab or somebody maybe is feeling niggles and we would just want to stay away from that, then, um, then maintaining that car- cardiorespiratory fitness through some, some of those types of cross-training activities um, comes into play. But I really use cross-training much more as a feature development of, of running. So in other words, so example that I had before of, of strength training. So using very heavy strength training and specific uh, movements to try to stimulate some of that early uh, economy sort of development, neuromuscular control recruitment. And we actually know now too that that strength training actually seems to build your work capacity above critical speed, which is interesting without actually moving critical speed. And and that connection, we don't really don't know, understand really well at all. But there, there are definitely things that we can use to build components of uh, running or lay the foundation so that the subsequent running you can get more out of in a different way. So that's what I really use cross training for in healthy, uh, in healthy athletes. We and, and, oh, go, go on, David. Well, I just think what you were saying there about heavy lifting is fascinating because for any nonlinear response to like, or unexpected response to a stimulus that's introduced. Um, and I think that that's kind of in running, it's a little bit less common than it is in cross training. So whether it's heavy lifting or any type of lifting or something like, I mean, you know, probably as coaches, we've all seen things that surprise us. You know, it's not always like, I know exactly what I'm doing as a coach and something works out perfectly. I've seen athletes use the elliptical and really bust their butt on the elliptical hard in addition to running and then become mountain running, like make the U S mountain running team doing that work. Um, when they weren't at that level before. And like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if everyone would respond that way. It might be like a kind of a Robin Dakota issue where it's like 15 different variables. And this is the one I latch onto because it's easiest for me to understand. But I think we do have evidence that this work is almost never bad as long as it doesn't burn an athlete out. Um, you know, and, and I think the studies support that too. The issue just becomes when, um, people think that like, you know, that you don't consider the, the nonlinear nature of the adaptation process in this. So, um, yeah, I'm always interested in what people do like in this, in cross training, because it seems like two different athletes or, you know, 10 different athletes with the same stimulus of cross training will respond very differently. Maybe that relates to overall stress or their background or whatever. Um, but I mean, I think it is one of those frontiers of, of trail and ultra ultra training that like I love hearing from you guys because I mean I don't know if there is an answer I've seen I mean I've seen ultra running articles and stuff that say cross training isn't good and good and then studies that all say it's good and you know everything in between and I think a lot of that comes down to just how it's being used as a concept it can mean different things like Sean's definition was very different to what most people would think but I would say one key area where it can pretty much always help a runner is kind of what Sean was alluding to a little bit there, which is someone who maybe has weaknesses or imbalances. And so if they get a stride analysis, a gait analysis, and it's showing they have certain muscles that are tighter, certain muscles that need to be developed more, and then doing strength work to help in that particular way. So it then makes their running form better because the, the way you move is basically the path of least resistance. If you've got weakness in one area, if you've got tightness in one area, the body kind of works around that. So if you can make all of that, the biomechanics as efficient and uh, as strong and as good a kind of working as a team as possible, then you're going to be a better runner and it's just going to flow through to a better, more efficient, uh, better running economy, uh, faster speeds. And, and so that I would say is something that probably most runners can benefit from because almost all of us have little flaws in the way we run that could be improved. And, and I'd certainly count that as, as a form of cross training because it's strength work. It's just very specific. And a lot of the things we're talking about here are more generic, like going hard on the bike, going hard on the elliptical. But if it's working on a particular weakness, uh, and especially if it's allowing you to maybe do a bit more work on that than you could if you were purely running, that is a way that it could be, I think, more effective for almost anyone. So it's about tailoring it to what that individual needs as well. And you know, something that we've been that we've been learning about in terms of development, when we look at kids, kids in sports, kids who specialize earlier tend to be less likely to become great at their sport, pros at their sport. And, and higher chance of injury, isn't it, as well? That's true. More injuries. Yeah. But, th- but that relationship holds even when you account for attrition. 
And so injuries would be part of attrition, mm -hmm. uh, staleness, mental boredom being pushed too early, all part of attrition. Attrition being uh, people drop out of the sport completely just because they just don't want to do it anymore or because of injury. But even when you account for that, it, it appears that through development, you know, developmental ages, that engaging in lots of different sports helps them later on when they do specialize. I and, you know, I view that as a way, as, a, as an issue of sort of developmental cross-training. And it just points out that regardless of what sports we're looking at, uh, base, because these are like baseball and football studies and such, that it, that having the experience and whatever that is physiologically, maybe psychologically as well, of varied sports does benefit them much later on. Kind of going back to something that David pointed out, epigenetics. You know, I as a scientist, I love to think that epigenetics are involved in that, but also maybe, you know, in other issues of, of development. And so for, especially for our athletes that are somewhat new to running or haven't, you know, weren't doing a lot of running in their younger years as, as people get older, for them even maybe, maybe um, doing more alternate activities uh, at least early on is a, is a good thing. It makes them more well-rounded, not just physically, but also mentally. You know, if you're used to team sports and competition and the heat, being in the heat of the moment, that's helping you also with racing later on and, and the challenges that causes and the stresses that cause. Whenever I have a, uh, a new runner that I'm working with, I always find out what their background is, obviously, from, from not just running, but other sports. And if they say they used to play soccer a lot, and they didn't get injured. If they got a knee injury from it, that's a bad thing. But if they played it and they didn't pick up any long-term injuries, that always tends to be one of the clearest indicators of them being a an injury-free runner because soccer in particular has a lot of endurance, a lot of quick changes of direction, moving in all, rain, all, all planes of, of motion. And all of that's really helpful for building up a strong um, bulletproof body, basically, as long as you don't pick up a nasty injury, like, and, and that can certainly happen to a lot of people uh, as they do it. But, uh, that, you know, that's helping with it pure, purely physically, but I think emotionally and mentally and just uh, the way they can then approach other sports. Because if, if you are a runner from the age of five onwards, then you can be even more attached to it than we already are. And we're all obviously fully into running and it's a big part of our personality. But if you've had other things in the past, it can give you better perspective as well on the running and that'll probably avoid things like overtraining and injuries and help you deal with things that aren't perfect as well. So I, being well-rounded is, is useful in, in every sense of, uh, and, and in particular with uh, being a better runner as well. Yeah, and knowing when to go specific, I guess. I think that's so awesome that there's this support for that because I just started coaching high school cross country, which is a whole new world to like walk into. And there was a parent meeting the other night where all the athletes' parents were there and you could see the intensity of the different parents. And I just have this feeling of let them play, like let kids play, whatever play being like go all over the board. And there's a lot of push for this like sports spe sports specificity so early and I'm 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 going to dig into that a little bit because I think it's awesome to hear that there's support to say no let them play cuz that is going to be the thing that helps them be a better athlete later on this sports specificity now maybe is going to lead to burnout or something that's going to take it what what the end goal for the parent is is actually not going to happen because they're pushing this early so awesome awesome reporting on that sean thanks and you see that with a lot of professional tennis players who kind of burn out like i, I think uh justine Enan uh from a few years ago she kind of got to world number one and she decided she was kind of bored with it um because if you start playing when you're a little kid and all you're doing is competing and the sport is not fun it's just about winning then you will burn out and even if you're physically capable of doing a lot more it's very difficult to mentally keep doing that if you've been doing it in that way your entire life rather than playing, basically. And, and I think it's really important for kids to have a variety of different things they they uh, they get to try out before they hone in on, on one thing. And ideally, even when they do hone in, have a little bit of the other stuff as well. Well, so I'd be fascinated to hear how this applies to, in like the running context, especially in cross training. So what I would... like. A study I would love, and we can only do anecdotal stuff because I am not going to be setting up a study design anytime soon, is looking at runners when they're 30, 40, 50, and 60, like a cross-section of runners or over time, like a population study, and figuring out how they progress or regress relative to their peak with different amounts of cross-training and rest mixed in, but especially cross-training. Because my feeling, just based on 
the n equals whatever number I I either coach or know directly is um, the athletes that are excelling at older ages usually have excelling maybe more relative to their younger selves usually have a little bit more cross training in their background um, and in their present than athletes that might not. Um, so that would kind of be my like interpretation of this and, and something that might be interesting to know is what happens to the athletes that do, you know, the big running miles at the expense of maybe other things versus the athletes that mix it up a little bit and do more cross training. Um, my, my theory would be that the cross training athletes hold their peaks longer and, um, perform better at, at later ages. And, you know, Ian himself might actually be a, a relatively good example of this. Not that he's aging, but that his peak is I'm definitely aging. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like your peak has kept getting better relative to maybe some of your peer group who have regressed in that time, or at least not progressed against the studs that are coming to the sport every year. Um, and you know, you're known for treadmill uh, or not treadmill, but like hiking weight vest hiking and hiking just generally being your biggest, like one of your, you know, your 90 hundredth percentile skill, like you're better at it than anyone. And maybe that that is part of the reason that you improve relative to everyone else because your running is, is great. You're getting better at running, but, um, this cross training element is kind of like those kids that don't specialize. It allows you to improve across the board when other people might tap out what they're capable of, you know? So in other words, by being more of a, that almost lets you be more of a generalist, even though it's pretty specific to ultra running. I don't know. Well, I'd actually say that a big part of that and not just myself, but in general is that the, if you do more than one thing, then if you're having something go wrong, wrong with your running, maybe it's a running specific injury that allows you to do another sport, then you can still be in love with running when you're not doing it. While if you have nothing else that you do and you hate all forms of cross training and going on the bike is the most horrible thing ever, then when you're not running, it'll feel worse and worse. And then that puts more pressure on the running. And that means that there's more chance of injury in the future. And then that can get to the point where you just suddenly go, running's not worth it anymore. My relationship with it is not healthy anymore. While if you have these other things, I think it allows you to, again, keep more of a balance and therefore probably keep doing running, not just well, but in a way that you enjoy for a longer period. So, it, you know, coming back to the original question of uh, is cross training essential? I would say for the long term, probably. Like you've got to have some form of balance in there to remain uninjured and other things. But if it's more about can you have an awesome season doing no cross training? Of course you can. You can just nail it with the running, but maybe you burn out, maybe you get injured, uh, and maybe your running career for fun or professional is uh, is shorter as a result of that. So I'd say there's probably a, a, a trade-off in the longer term if you don't have at least some other things that you're doing. If we want the most out of if somebody wants to reach their absolute peak of what they're capable within six months or a year, you know, then it's all running, hammer it, but you risk, you know, mm -hmm. you risk. And if you want somebody who is going to be consistent and progress for a long period of time, then I think that model doesn't, that breaks down and that doesn't work. But I want to think just really quickly about what is cross training per se, because Ian, you know, you specialize, especially in, in hundred milers. How much hiking do you do when, when you run Leadville? I'm probably hiking 20 miles out of 100. So, so I'm, I'm doing something that is not just cross training. It's specific to the race. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the other thing that I always reinforce to people when they're going, oh, well, I should be trying to run everything. It's like in the 100 miler, are you going to be running every step of that? No, you're going to be going up a 20% gradient in 100 degree heat at a full on run. Probably not unless you're the world's best. <laughs> and so that's where everyone else, it, it's really yeah. important to do specific training and some forms of cross training are very, very specific, uh, even walking practicing walking just on the flat terrain if you're doing a hundred miler the odds are most people are going to do some walking because their stomach feels bad or something else so if you get better at walking and hiking then your minimum speed is higher this is one of the, the key things i always reinforce to people for the longer distances is it's not about getting your I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is maximum performance getting a vo2 max up being faster but ultimately what leads to better performance in a really long race is where is your low end what what, what is the slowest pace you're going to go at no matter how bad you feel how fast can you move if you're going up a hill and your stomach's bad and you're at altitude and you're 80 miles into a race 
can you still do a 20 minute mile no matter how bad you feel? Or does that go down to a 60 minute mile? Because then you're losing 40 minutes in a mile and it's impossible to go 40 minutes a mile quicker when you're feeling good. Maybe it's a, you know, nine minute miles an eight minute mile when you get fitter, but it's not going to be saving to the same uh, degree of, of time there. So it's more keeping your minimum speed up to as high as it can be than keeping your maximum speed up to what it can be. <laughs> we think so much in terms of upper end thresholds. Thinking in terms of lower end thresholds is a fascinating <laughs> paradigm shift that I'll need to write about that at some point. That's something that like... That, that's why I can get away with 100 milers, but I can't compete as much in the shorter distances because I don't have as high a high end as some of the other guys, but I've got a really good low end and that matters much more for a longer distance. That's Dave, really well said. <laughs> David, that's I just stay the same pace. <laughs> a bit of what I was getting at when we were emailing this weekend because for a 100 miler, you a, a person averages a pace that is close to the first, what would say the first ventilatory threshold or the, the onset of blood lack, you know, accumulation of that is just above resting. And it's a pace that is just trivially slow for, for anybody. And that's, the, that's what, that's an average pace for a hundred miler. And yet, you know, so we don't train a lot at, at that. So sprinting engages musculature that is used more in uphill running or hiking than than so much in, in flat. And so I would say your know, sprinting is, is specific training for, for running fast flats, but it's cross training for hiking uphill. Hiking uphill is specific training for a large percentage of a hundred miler, but it's cross training for running faster on flats. And so sometimes our activities are a little bit of both depending on the, the races that we're in, depending on the performances that we're looking for too. It, yeah. It's completely down to what you're training for. If you're trying to train for a 5K on the road or the track, you're probably not going to gain much from hiking. Maybe a little bit of, of, of benefit from just active recovery. But if you're training for a mountain race of any distance, that's going to be part of it. So it, it's, it's not just what is cross-training, i.e. different from your sport, but also how much does it overlap? And the more it overlaps, the more useful it's going to be typically. Yeah. And um, I think that gets to like oh, something that, at least for me, is a helpful way to think about it, and it might be for some of the people listening, is in terms of what Ian mentioned in his very first answer, and you all have been talking about since, is specificity to the event and like structuring your own like specificity totem pole, essentially, where something's at the top, something's at the bottom, and knowing where each falls in, with the idea being that we all agree cross-training is good, though like the amount might vary a little bit. So like, Hiking and, you know, maybe if you, like you even said, Sean, that like something like strides could even be a type of cross training for some athletes, but like that's at the very top that that's always going to be pretty specific. Um, and then maybe at the bottom would be swimming or something along those lines or that, that essentially doesn't use your legs in the same way, but it's not, that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's like as far away from the activity as you can really get. Um, and then in between lies everything, whether it's like, so, you know, hiking, running different t things like that. Like that could also be treadmill hiking or stair mill. I've seen athletes have a lot of su success with, um, you know, what I have a lot of athletes do is treadmill hiking where they'll set it on. Usually they're like 24 hour fitness, 15%. And if they can get comfortable hiking at four and a half miles an hour, eventually with good form, like it often translates to the athletes having probably the higher low end, as you mentioned, Ian, then elliptical and bike kind of the next couple and then to fill it in after that, um, with the idea of being like, you don't want to exacerbate any injuries, but, um, you know, in that adding those in is almost always beneficial as long as like, you're not exhausted. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought like if, if different people have different thoughts about like which activities are best, um, you know, Chrissy, do you like, do you use any gym equipment or anything like that? In cross training? Definitely. Yeah, and recommending it to my clients too, for sure. Awesome. Not just with weights, but elliptical or swimming or rowing. Again, just finding something that they'll do. do you or, like, but, I mean, a bike outside or whatever. In a perfect world, like, what's your favorite? Whatever the personal, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Okay. I, say I, I think that's one of the key key principles there of all training is it's better to do something that's kind of good than to not do something that's awesome. Yeah. And personally, I have a love hate relation relationship with the elliptical machine. I love it because it allows me to do something that's that's close for me that works for me. And but if I'm on it, it probably means I'm dealing with something that doesn't allow me to run. 
and in some cases you, you you can bring those those all to, together that is finding something that, that a person loves to do but uh, I would say tricking them tricking them into also doing this the the sort of work that you want them to do so for example I have athletes that just hate the gym maybe they, they just don't want to be indoors at all and yeah. so the ideas of heavy squats to them are just like they just like forget it you know you're fired if, that, if you're going to make me do that <laughs> and and but so what we, but what we do are very steep bikes so biking out you know outdoors or on the, but very steep hills and they're getting that very slow grind push mm -hmm. single leg presses where i'm getting them basically to do the same thing mm -hmm. but in an activity that they enjoy and that's where hiking, I think, can be good because to a runner, it's much easier to say, go and hike up some hills and this is your cross training, especially if you do it with a weight vest. Then you're getting strength in the legs, you're getting strength in the core, you're getting a lot of stabilization muscles being used. And you're basically tricking them into doing really specific, well, not tricking, you're, you're getting them to do very specific um, strength and stability work for running that should then hopefully mean that their form deteriorates less towards the end of any race because they're feeling a little bit stronger and the smaller muscles can can deal with things for a little bit longer. So that, that I'd say, is, is a big part of it as well. Again, it's about being specific of, of what's going to help them the most and, and what is someone likely to do. And it's much easier to convince someone to go out and do walking and hiking than to do other forms of cross-training that they really don't like doing or that are a hassle because the gym's only open certain hours and they've got to fit it around work and things like that. Mm -hmm. I can't hear you, David. No, I can't hear. <laughs> Sorry. Um, since this is geared to an ultra audience in particular, I think, you know, one thing that we've really come to mostly consensus on is that hiking is just an essential component. And it's as much of a, a skill that needs to be developed, especially neuromuscularly, as like any sort of running is. Um, like, I mean, and, and that also, that explains in a lot of ways, 100 mile performance. I mean, Claire Gallagher, and one of the best hikers I've ever seen. Um, she, to the, you know, she lives in the mountains of Colorado. She hikes a lot under running. She doesn't need to do it in like a focused way. Um, Ian, one of the best hikers of, ever. Um, Killian, best hiker ever. You He's know, definitely a better hiker than me. Yeah, yeah. There's different scales of that. <laughs> sure. I, maybe if you guys were both on a 12% on a grade and had to hike, you would beat him on that. But Killian and like, 40 I think he, he could hop up a gradient like that. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> Schemo, yeah. hike is yeah. power hiking all winter yeah. long. For yeah. sure. And so in other words, like for almost anyone listening to this, if you're doing ultras as your focus races, becoming proficient at hiking is like a massive skill. And I think most would f call it cross training. So no matter what our terminology is, like it's probably something that they need to plan in a, in a concerted way since most will default to running um, in that it's an opportunity to go faster, essentially. And, you know, I mentioned the treadmill hiking, but basically hiking as like a chance to really get moving faster than you would otherwise. And um, to, to grasp that opportunity, as opposed to viewing hiking as a, as a break or something where, oh, I can't run. So I guess I'm hiking now and I'm hiking about the same as everyone else. Ian is shown as has Claire and Gillian that, no, everyone hikes at different paces. And not only that, like the body gets used to it. Um, so maybe it's not a skill that you need to develop all year. Unlike running where like if generally running, you want to develop over time your speed, but, um, hiking, like you can get really, even if you're a big race, you're listening to this and it's three weeks out. Most people could get much more accustomed to hiking in that time with just a little bit of work. Um, and yeah, so to basically view hiking as, um, like a quiver in your, uh, or an arrow that you you have to fire as opposed to like something that you're burdened with in long races. That, that's I a think lot of it. It's, it's the mental switch there between thinking of hiking as a choice and thinking of it as what you do when you can no longer run. And you're going to want to be thinking of it as something you're purposefully using as a weapon, as you say, one of your arrows in the quiver, rather than as the default for a rest or when you're not doing as well. And a, a couple of the little tips that I would say about that are when you practice hiking, um, ideally push as pretty much as hard as you can, whether on your treadmill or going up a mountain, push hard. So you're going to the edge like you'd want to do with a speed session. You're trying to improve, improve your VO2 max, push a little bit beyond what you can do. As long as you're doing that hard, you're going to get adaptations to be a better hiker. And also you're going to get more used to the mental side of it, which is just different to running that, you know, if you're doing a two hour hike up a mountain and that, you know, a lot of races will have that kind of thing or longer, 
you've got to get used to just getting into that groove where you're not settling back and taking it easy, but you are really pushing the hiking. And you can afford to do that pretty hard because you'll only get your heart rate up so high when you hike compared to if you try to run up it where your heart rate could go through the roof. So uh, it's tr always try and push hard with the hiking. Also try and do varying gradients so that you're sometimes hiking on your toes, sometimes with a uh, shorter step, sometimes a longer step. And then you're kind of getting all the different ways the muscles can be used and kind of you're, you're improving all the types of hiking. So no matter what happens within a race, you'll be better at dealing with it. So it's mainly just making sure your hiking is something you, you try and push, not just something you, you take easy. And again, if you're, that, that's where your slow speed is. So if you're taking it easy and you do a 40 minute mile uphill or you push hard and you do a 20 minute mile, there's massive gains being made there on every single hill. That was made so evident to me. I think it was the 2013 World Mountain Champs. So this is like a 10K race. This is all out as hard as you can for like 40 or 50 minutes. And so I'm like, oh, this is a running, this was back right when I was starting coaching. And so, you know, it wasn't particularly, like it wasn't, I was learning as I went. And um, around like four, mile four, the entire Italian team who are amazing mountain runners, I was running as hard as I could up a hill and they passed me like I was standing still all hiking. Um, like in a train of hikers. And I mean, I, I always remember looking at them being like, that's not just hiking, that's cross training. They all bike. They're all like, um, many of them are cyclists too. And, um, you know, it, it's good to think of when you're thinking of what we're talking about with cross training, that the skill set in ultra running is so varied. And, um, you know, it comes in handy, not just in 100 milers, but sometimes in 10Ks. Um, against or VK. A VK is only five kilometers right. long. And if you can't hike, you probably can't do a VK well, because maybe some people can run every step of it. But even if they do, it might be more efficient to throw in little bits of hiking here and there to get a higher average pace. And in any race, it's about your average pace. No one cares about your top speed. If you do a four minute mile within a marathon, it doesn't matter if you finish it in four hours. Uh, it's, but if you can average a 430 mile, then that's the average that matters. I was just going to add some stuff to that because a lot of times you'll get asked or I've been asked as a coach, when do I hike? Like, when do I throw this in? You're having me do these hiking intervals, but when do I really use that in a race? One of the mental ways that I look at it or, and have encouraged people and it seems to help is early in a race. Let's say we're doing a 50 mile race and it's early in the race and I'm looking at the, the profile ahead of time in my planning or when I'm out there and I'm actually running it. Like, will I be able to run this at mile 40? Because if I can't, I probably should be hiking mm -hmm. now because I want to have the opportunity. Somebody's coming up to me. I want to be competitive or I'm looking at my, like the cutoffs of the race. Am I going to make it? I want to have that running energy later in the event. So that's like for the when to hike, giving that people a chance to like, how do I mentally integrate this hiking when I'm actually trying to perform a race? The other thing I found, and I you maybe saw this with those Italians blowing by you as they're hiking and then you get to the top of the hill and transition time. So if I'll tell people like look for a tree or some kind of marker that that's when you want to be running by. So you start thinking about it. And I'll even say start swinging your arms like you're running even though you're still power hiking so that by the time you get to that landmark, you're running. So building in these efficiencies, how this becomes a tool in the quiver as opposed to like, as you're saying like, oh, I'm blown out. And so now I have to walk. It's like, no, it's really integrated and it's going to come back into my running. And then when you get to that point where you are running again, the people that like ran, I bet if you, I've seen for myself, if I hang with them with my power hiking and then you get to the top and oh, now I have, past them. Yeah. I have running <laughs> muscles to use because mm -hmm. I've been using my hiking muscles. If you like try and put it in a mental mind differently. Now I'm engaging my running muscles. Their running muscles are already fatigued. And whether that's against somebody else or just improving your own time, I think those are just like little ways to define what that little tool is, that arrow in the quiver or whatever. I actually did a little experiment on a, a particular hill. It's a mile and a half of climbing at about a 15% gradient. And uh, I tried running every step of it. I uh, tried doing what I would want to do if it was a race with a run-hike combo and hiking when I thought it was appropriate. And I tried hiking every step. And I think it was about 15 minutes to run it. It was about 16 minutes to do the run-hike combo. And it was about 18 minutes to do the hiking only. And the thing that was crazy about it was how I felt at the top. The running every step, I virtually needed to lie down at the top. You know, <laughs> I, I, I could not, if that was a race, keep going well. The run hike, I felt fine at the top and I because I'd been hiking every time to take it down a notch. So I'd only a, a little bit slower, but then I could run normally and then hiking as well, obviously run normally at the top. So 
it, it was really interesting to me how much of a penalty there was for hiking when you're using it strategically. And the answer was not much, basically. Cool. To throw a little science in there too, Ian, just to, to leverage that, when you... When you're doing that and you're running uphill and you're, you're going you know, unsustainable, you, you can't do that for 20 miles, right? So you're probably above critical power. And there's a certain amount of work that you're capable of doing above critical power before you absolutely will fatigue. And it's, it's for you at any given moment, it's, it's known in a specific amount. You can use it up quickly or slowly, but that's the amount of work that you can do before you poop out. Um, and so... What's really interesting, though, is that the rate at which you regain that work of capacity when you lower your intensity very low, the rate at which you regain that is enormously variable among people. So I know, I know David is fond of talking about you only get to go to the well once, and so you, know, and you leave that for later and at the end of the race. And that's a really good point here that when you use it up, like you're talking about at the top of that hill, you have to back off so much to be pretty much have, walking. That was the pretty thing. Much Once walking. I got flat, I had to walk. And even slower. Because I put every last bit of energy to getting to the top. And you see this so much in, in any race, you know, that someone makes a great move halfway through an ultra or halfway through a marathon. But if they've really delved quite deep into what they're capable of, then suddenly the pace that would have been easy if they hadn't gone so hard is now like redlining pace and will only get slower through the rest of the event. So it, it again, it's about thinking of hiking as a weapon and a choice rather than as this weak thing you do where when you no longer can run. And I know a couple of people who who very good runners. They could do up to 50 miles awesomely, win national championships and stuff. But their mentality was they had to run every step. And then when they could no longer run, it's like, okay, well, I'm probably going to have a crappy race now. And it did, just didn't work in 100 milers for them, where they could be in the lead at 50 miles into a competitive 100 miler and then fall right back because then they just had to walk most of it because they'd gone over this red line and they hadn't been, they just didn't like the idea of hiking. They felt like it was giving up. And so just changing the mentality of that can make a big difference, not only to your training, but also to your ability to race well. Ian, we often run in training very slow. You know, we, we often have, have miles that are, that are pretty, pretty slow. You're putting in the miles. But you talked about when you're hiking, really hit, hitting it hard a lot of the time. Do you ever purposely hike slow? If it's recovery from after a race, that kind of thing. So I, I will, after I do a hundred mile, I'll usually try and transition back into things with hiking before I do running. So that's the time where there's no pressure on it at all. But otherwise, usually pretty hard hiking most of the time, because I know I can afford it. Like we were talking about with the cycling, because cycling doesn't have the muscle damage, the impact forces like hiking uphill, especially doesn't have the muscle damage. So you can afford to do it quite hard and recover well from it, especially if your body is already used to it, while you can't afford to do hard pounding and running so soon after a hard effort or so soon after a race. So it, it, it kind of it has a lot of similarities to the other forms of cross training that are lower impact because especially uphill, the impact forces are even lower with hiking. Our cross training conversation just got really specific. I feel like it was a hiking <laughs> conversation. It did. <laughs> I, think that's a, I, I think hiking is, is just because it's at the top of the specificity is really important. Um, you know, what I would say to everyone else is also have a bike that you like. Um, that you can just use to ride around. Like you don't have to ride it ever if you don't want to, but you know, I love when athletes bike commute to work or something like that. Just something that they don't even consider aerobic work, but that does add up over time. It's just movement. Yeah. Choosing to move rather than take the stairs rather than the elevator, um, One thing I would add to get to that, a good pint of milk instead of driving there. Well, uh, with the cycling to work, commuting to work, there was, there have seen that for some athletes that they, but yes, it's movement, but they're not accounting for it in terms of the overall fatigue and sometimes like my workout didn't go as well or this and that can't put it together. Well, I'm like, well, you spent an hour on your bike today too. Like just to give them the mental, like, okay, that that does, you were late to work and you rode hard. That's going to factor into your workout at night. So just the one little thing on like adding that in is just a, a gift of economy, if you will. Sometimes you have to factor it in that could be a detractor from something else you're trying to do. And yeah, that's Sean's awesome. point about the holistic approach to everything where Everything you do, sleeping, your psychological training, all of that is factoring. It's not just the running we're talking about. Everything else you do is part of your training. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you bike a bit harder, if you have a stressful day at work, if you don't get as much sleep, if you change time, time zones, Sit on the whatever it all may day. be, anything <laughs> that leaves you tired is going to have an effect there. And you've got to just be able to, to work out all of those things and, and allow for them. To, to pull this all the way back off of the specificity <laughs> and, and, and just leverage ideas on non-specificity, there's a great um, thought-provoking article by a guy named John Kiley. Uh, that I've promoted and tweeted about this article a few times a few years ago talking about block training. And this is a little bit more with other sorts of sports and other training, but talking about block training and that there was all this research that came out about block training, how great block training is. And he really wanted us all to step back and think about the possibility that all of the benefits of these block training studies have been not at all because of block training, but simply because of changing how a person is training. You know, you've gotten used to the way that you train And it's just simply the fact of stressing the body and cells and pathways and such a little bit differently for a period of time. And that can, you know, who knows the hundreds of thousands of sort of thing, the dominoes that fall with doing that. But I think it also goes all the way back to something that David said earlier in talking about one athlete who just hammered elliptical for a while and things changed for them. And sometimes we really sit down on, 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 attributing changes to what we see the person did. And we always have to keep a really open mind and say, what, what's all the stuff that's going on here? And it may be just simply that they're doing something different in a purposeful and deliberate way. Mm-hmm. My, my favorite thing about that article is the questions it raises about like the neurophysical context of training in the first place, that not just the tr- stimulus you're presenting, but the the mental state on which that stimulus is overlaid and how important that is. And so maybe the, maybe one of the conclusions here is that cross training works if you think it's working. Uh, (laughs) And, you know, the, and and I think we all see that with running training, right? Like the, an athlete, like belief is one of the most important things in athletic development for a reason. Um, And so maybe part of what we're seeing here is like one mixing it up is, is good, especially for a sport that is, highly variable as Ian and Chrissy were saying earlier, but two, maybe just mixing it up mentally is needed for some athletes to avoid burnout and injuries that come from burnout. Like that, you know, when we're talking about injury, we might not just be talking about overstress of bones and joints. We might be talking a little bit about overstress of mental systems that then lead to injuries in other places. In other words, that, you know, because we don't, because it's a complex system with multiple variables, we don't understand how those interact to form the final outcome. And so what Keeley's article is, I think, really good at, you know, not necessarily providing answers, but asking questions that, like, as coaches, especially as ultra coaches, where there are, like, Mm -hmm. so many variables that we all have to think about. And, um, you know, maybe if you're an athlete listening to this, the goal is just kind of to do, well, you know, to do what you like the most as getting, while improving your speed enough so that you can keep improving over time I like the baseline running skills. Um, or maybe it's just talking- related to that, though, is the fact that we're talking about cross training of non running things. What about just the cross training of doing different types of running? So I think it's really important for people to do more than one just type of th- more than one type of, of racing in particular. So I personally like switching between maybe road running flatter stuff through the winter because it's easier to train for. And it's just a change of speed and, and what the body's going through, the types of strain it, it takes on and then more mountainous stuff in the summer. So anyone who likes road and trail, at least to a small degree, I always try and encourage them to have different parts of the year where you train for one and different parts where you train for another, because that is also a form of cross training. It's providing the variety. It's providing a better longevity, both physically and uh, emotionally for your, your desire to keep doing the sport. Well, I'd say that also in a week to week basis, I think what I have to coach more often than intervals or tempos or speed is that the slower pace or the economy mileage people, I've got an hour to run. I got to run as hard as I can <laughs> every hour, like seven days a week. And, within the week, mixing up the pace. And I like how you said that in terms of um, cross training of how you run, just choosing different paces as a part of that uh, mentality of of what your body's doing at a eight mile minute or eight minute a mile or, you know, sub six or whatever in in, in, a workout. And and just to make a comment there to back up just a second, David, the article you're talking about is is a more recent one. So he's got these two really thought provoking article. The one is just about sort of training planning but this one um really 
talking about our ideas of Hans Selye and stress adaptation response, general adaptation syndrome, and 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 really how the brain and your thought processes influence the milieu that that cells are in, are involved in. If you're really stressed out, well, cortisol levels are high. So there's a very obvious direction that cortisol levels may shift, even epigenetics, but may shift the the other pathways that are active within a cell. And then when muscle cell contracts, is it going to respond and adapt and change differently? You know, and so th- thought means a lot. But we also know, of course. The placebo effect is a really real thing, <laughs> of course, right? And in, we mentioned this even in a previous discussion that if people are happy, feel good about their workout, they're looking forward to it, they have a good positive outlook, we all have experienced that our athletes seem to progress faster, seem to get more out of it. And you can put real numbers on that when they're staying positive. And I know David doesn't like to stay positive, but he likes to hammer people, <laughs> but that that's why psychology to me and that mindset and how you view things, how you frame things, and then how you reframe things is really, really important here in all of this. Yeah. And cross training is a great way to really harness that atmosphere of growth. That is essentially what we're talking about when we're talking about positivity, you know, where you think you're moving forward in a positive direction, not just for running speed, but you know, for sure, your mental state and, you know, periodization, um, sorry about confusing those two, but periodization probably gets to the same idea in a lot of ways where, yeah, there's, there's a lot of reasons to do it. Um, you know, that we, that we've talked about as an ad nauseum over the course of training history, but maybe one of the biggest reasons to do it is just that it feels like it's, you know, it's the best way to work. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, it, it gets back to with, with cross training, I think, probably cross training isn't the most useful thing if you hate it, um, no matter what you're doing. And, um, you know, if you, if you enjoy it or if you can bring yourself to enjoy it through the atmosphere of growth, then doing these things, whether it's hiking or elliptical or biking while doing what Chrissy said and balancing stress so that you're not going overboard either, um, can be really productive. And then at the margins, you know, gets back to the N equals one thing where we're all so different. And, um, you know, I found that, and I mean, probably everyone, all the coaches I'm sure have found something similar that in general athletes over 40 or 50 respond better to more cross training than athletes that might be in their twenties. There might be more of a necessity to bring up total volume though. Of course there's exceptions. And, um, I've also seen like a number of pro female athletes respond incredibly to cross training, but then you have people like Rob and Dakota that come and, you know, crush all the top guy men in the world with cross training. So, um, yeah, being really like attuned to your own dose response curves at these sorts of things and, you know, keeping an open mind the whole time. That sounded like a big wrap up statement. So let's, let's, Mm -hmm. let's do that perhaps. And, 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 and just kind of go around the horn if anybody wants to, uh, wrap up statements or if there's something that we didn't pull out here that really you wanted to. Uh, my, my last one thing to say is just uh, there's no one perfect way to train. And I think all of our conversations every time are showing that, you know, it's not like cross training will work and this is the perfect way you do it and everyone should do it the same way. It's it'll depend on your circumstances and even to the extent of what you enjoy will have a big effect, like David was just saying. So it's, it's mainly just knowing that the, a little bit of experimentation can be good just to try something new for the sake of doing something new, especially if you've been plateauing or finding injuries keep popping up or something like that. But uh, ultimately, yeah, there's lots of different pathways to, to becoming a better and faster runner. And better is not necessarily the same as faster. There's a lot of elements to running, like the enjoyment out of it, of course, that are important. Final yeah. thoughts, Chrissy? Final thoughts. I just really enjoyed the conversation. I thought it was a cool way. I thought I, I was kind of laughing at us at how we did draw right into the specificity of <laughs> hiking and how it could um, be a key thing. But we are ultra runners, and that's a big part of what we do. So it made a, it made a, it makes a lot of sense too. Hopefully, people got a lot out of it. David, I really enjoyed how you were kept ad- addressing the audience today too. I thought that was <laughs> was cool. Um, yeah, I loved what Ian just said about better is not always faster. Um, you know, and I think that that's, that's a temptation for all coaches and athletes to think it is. And, um, you know, with ultra running, especially it's not. So I just urge people when thinking about cross training or any other decision to really zoom out and think of yourself on five-year time horizons, at least in both directions and not 
think of what you just did or what you're just doing or anything like that, because the decisions you make will be totally different. And I think cross training's important importance really starts to become more evident when you zoom out um, more and more. So that could be a whole conversation right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it probably will end up being one day. <laughs> yeah. And to address the, the people who have are watching and listening, you know, we didn't maybe get to say, here's how you should cross train, which some people are looking for. But hopefully what we did do and make very clear that there isn't a here's how you should cross train at all. It's more about how, how should you think about cross training yeah. for your circumstance rather than this is the thing you should do. Brilliant. Well, thanks all. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Awesome. Thanks.